Connie Orlando, uh, you're the executive vice president and head of programming at BET, and you produced the 20th annual BET Awards last June. Um, and it was a you know pretty uneventful time, just COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement, the 40th anniversary of the network. That's all. Uh, so uh, you know, first off, like probably one of the biggest factors going into it. Like, at what point did you know that things wouldn't be opening back up due to the pandemic, and that the whole BET Awards show? would really have to be reinvented. You know what, I think it, it was in, in phases, right? So I think even when the pandemic started, I think none of us had any idea. We still thought that the, we'd be back by June. You know, we were like, oh, three weeks. And I think in April, we did a COVID relief special uh, mid-April. And even then we were, we were hopeful that it would open, you know, mid-May. But I think towards the end of April, we really, it hit us that we really need to, you know, one, uh, figure out if we're gonna do the show <laughs> and then two, you know, kind of pivot and how we would have to execute it this year. And, you know, we've seen uh, any number of iterations of the pandemic award show over the last year, but when you were doing the BET Awards in June, there wasn't really a template. Uh, you know, there were one or two other shows doing, I know the daytime Emmys were also in June last uh, year, like sort of close to the same time the BET Awards were, but like there was no, there was no set, like this is how you do a pandemic award show. So you're sort of like building it from the ground up. What, what, are, what are the considerations that are, when you, when you just start that process? You know, once we decided to do it, I think, you know, we were then terrified on, well, how do we do it? And like you said, it was a, we've never done anything like it before. We were all in this, in, in a pandemic that we've never been before. And it was just really, you know, it was terrifying at first. But then I think when, you know, after you kind of sit with it, we looked at it as an opportunity. And we looked at it from our POV, it was, what kind of BET awards would you do if you weren't limited to a hundred foot stage? So then in looking at it that way, it kind of took the railing off and it was like, okay, like this is, you know, we're able to do more than we in theory would have been able to do, you know, limited to, you know, a theater and a stage and an audience. And we kind of really just leaned into that and said, okay, what does this look like? Uh, what is the evolution of, of this creativity for this show? Uh, and of course, the the thematic sort of backdrop of the entire show, uh, you know, was uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, and you know how recently, uh, uh, you know, George Floyd's uh, killing happened, and the protests of that, and having to address that. You opened the show with Keydron Bryant doing "I Just Want to Live." Uh, like, what were what were the thoughts about you know that opening, and just sort of having that as a framing device for, you know, in, in a sense, the entire BET award show. Cause obviously the black entertainment television award show, it, you, you can't ignore what's front and center in the world. You know, and it's, it's interesting. So every, every year we, we actually speak to what, whatever's going on and whatever cause. And this year, like you said, with um, the killings of George Floyd, we were against this backdrop. Like you started saying that it's 20th year of BET awards, 40th year of the network. And before pre-pandemic, we were like, this is a very important show. And then when we were faced with where we were socially, it was like, this is the most important show because it's, it's we, we can give voice to have the platform give voice to what's going on real time. And, you know, once we put that in, it was just like, and you know, it was a global, there were global protests. Um, everybody was home during the, uh, during, um, the killing of George Floyd. So everyone saw what was going on. Everybody was particip participating and everybody was present. So with the show, it was, you know, it was organic. It was what everyone was feeling and we wanted to ca capture what people were feeling. And it was, you know, the artists wanted to say something, you know, about the, the social, social change, Black Lives Matter. So opening with Kidron was just so powerful to me, because it was right, it was just real, it was authentic, it was organic to what was going on. And it was just an important message. Um, so throughout the show with the performances, like if you look at Alicia Keys, A Perfect Way to Die and those powerful lyrics, if you look at um, John Legend, Never Break, um, The Baby did a powerful, you know, art imitating life. You know, he, he opened with his knee on, on a police officer's Knee, knee on his neck, sorry. Um, and then we had, you know, it was so important for us just to, to have the name said. 
And we did, you know, we had the celebrities reading all the names because, you know, for what we said, this wasn't new, but it was, and it wasn't just about one person. It was about this, this uh, racism that has been going on forever. And it was just important to kind of really give voice uh, to those things in this show. And even the, the performances that didn't specifically like the song speak to it, um, you notice that, you know, there were, um, I think Roddy Rich had on a Black Lives Matter. So there were all these messages and it's nothing new because I think musicians have always used their platform in times of turmoil and change to amplify, you know, the message and what was going on and how they felt about it. And having so many musical performances uh, during the show, uh, <clears throat> you know, had an, such an interesting effect because obviously instead of being in one place on a stage, uh, they're they're giving these these sort of these short films, these these art pieces. Uh, how much, if at all, did you work with each individual artist on what they were putting together, and how much like free reign did they have, just kind of follow wherever their music took them, their creativity took them? Like, what was that collaboration like? Well, it was still, you know, it was still very collaborative. Like we did millions of Zoom calls <laughs> and I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, but with each artist, like we still walk through, you know, the song, what the creative should be or what the creative would be, you know, the performance, the only difference was like, we weren't able to be there for them filming it. So it was all framed out. Nothing was a surprise. Like we framed out everything and then, you know, we, they shot it and then would uh, then, you know, send the, the footage to us to edit and, and put in the show. But no surprises, we just really, you know, we talked a lot about what it would look like and, you know, what they wanted to capture. So same process, but just not in person and not in, you know, days of rehearsal before the show on the stage. But we had so many incredible artists, like, you know, so of course the creativity like for this show was off the charts. Like, and I think you feel it in the show. Uh, and you've got Amanda Seals hosting the show uh, and, and walking that very kind of fine line between the humor that the event needs uh, and also the, the gravity of a lot of the events surrounding it. Uh, what was it like working with her on her hosting and, and bringing her on and having her deliver this and be a comedian with no audience and you know all the different challenges that, that she was facing. Well, one, she was just absolutely perfect. Like we're all huge fans of Amanda and this opportunity came up. We said, there's no one more perfect to do this. Um, and even if you, you talk about like the challenges of hosting without an audience, and then you even take it a step further, hosting from your house, <laughs> like, you know, she's a, a consummate professional she, she's great she knows she knows her craft so you know once we we confirmed amanda we knew that that was a, a yet another important piece of the puzzle with the show coming together when we were over the moon uh and you know one of the uh central moments of the event was uh, celebrating beyonce with uh, with the with the humanitarian award which was presented to her by michelle obama uh was that you know, had that been the plan uh, before the, the pandemic? Like, was that always uh, something that you wanted to do and that the show always wanted to do? Or, or and how did, how did that come together with her? You know, absolutely. Beyonce does so much. She does so much that we don't even know about because she doesn't talk about everything she does. But she's always, you know, been at the top of the list to honor for her humanitarian efforts. And, you know, I thought this year would be a great year. And, you know, we reached out and it was able to happen. And then there's no one better to, to give her that award than uh, our former first lady, uh, Michelle Obama. So that would have, you know, whether we were pre-pandemic or there was no, like we would have done that regardless. We've always, we love Beyonce and we just really want to honor, honor her and all that she does. Uh, and you mentioned uh, a, a million Zoom calls in preparation. Um, and I wonder, you know, because the logistics are, are different for, uh, you know, obviously for a pandemic show as opposed to in person. Are there more or less moving parts with one or the other? Because obviously when you're dealing with a, a live venue and a physical space, there it has its own set of challenges and concerns. Right. So like, wh which has the, uh, the most uh, complexities, would you say? You know, I would say, so when we're, when we're live at a venue, we have 400 people at any given time running around doing, you know, sets and lighting and making sure everything's right. 
And for this, it wasn't 400 uh, people running around, but the level of tech that had to be right to pull off this type of show was so complex. And we all had to learn it. So it wasn't like, oh, we know how to do it. It was like, okay, we have to learn how to do it. And then we have to figure out how to apply it to the show. And then we have to execute on it. So it was like a, a crash co course in tech for all of us. And, you know, and we were all at home. Like I teased last year, it was like, I think I produced more from my living room <laughs> than I, I did in person. But, you know, like I said, it's just, what a what a canvas to have to do you know the show and and then you know we're all in a pandemic it's not just work as usual you, all, you we're all dealing with the pandemic personally and you know emotionally in some sort of way uh, and one of the striking things about the the show which uh you know uh, to prepare for this i watched uh, uh you know uh like almost a year after it, it aired and it holds up uh how well it holds up uh in terms of as as not just uh, an award show, but as kind of this this celebration of music and art, and and this variety, this wide ranging variety program, uh, and it really kind of highlighted highlighted uh, you know kind of art and and how it's it's very helpful and very necessary to getting us through this you know the pandemic and all you know challenges that we all go through Absolutely. how does that feel to have you know kind of this completed document uh that still does carry weight uh you know even outside of the context of, of when it aired you know it feels great i am so proud of that show i am so proud um i think like to your point it's a year later and it still holds up and that just reinforces to me that we did it right we, we addressed things that needed to be addressed and we delivered entertainment in a space where the world was just emotional and going through so much. We were able to entertain, but also, you know, stay true and have a message. And, and you know, I, that was the very first show. Um, Cause I remember like, I always like to be first but it's very scary being first. <laughs> but I'm very proud of how that showed out. And, you know, I have the most creative people in the world on my team between Jesse Collins and Janae and Dion from the JCE side and Jamal from my side. Um, like we, we put in a lot of work and it was really a work from the heart, you know? And I, I'm just so, it's probably the most, is it? Yeah, I'm probably the most proud. Uh, okay, I'm gonna mess up that grammatically. But uh, of that show, because it just meant so much. It, it, had, it has feeling and it meant, and it was able to, to say something that resonated around the world. Uh, and with, you know, another BT Awards coming up, uh, you know, the, the world is still in the pandemic, but also things are starting to open up. People are getting vaccinated. I've been vaccinated, thankfully. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what are the kind of, what, what are the ideas around what kind of show this year's BT Awards are going to be? Still full virtual, a kind of hybrid, or, or do you know and are at liberty to say uh, anything? You know, we're really, the goal is really to be back. Like we're, I think the world, like you said, I'm vaccinated. The world is opening up. It's like this awakening, a reawakening of the world. Um, so, you know, my highest hope is that we'll, we'll be back in the venue in some sort of way and, and back live. I think the BT Awards is, is great virtually. It, but it's great live too. So I look forward to, you know, trying to figure that out this year. It's a different, you know, challenge for this May as we go into this next award show, but I'm looking forward to being back in a big way. Uh, and one of the, the, you know, few bright sides of, of the pandemic forcing award shows to go virtual is that it kind of forced everyone to reimagine the format and, uh, uh, you know, and the possibilities of it. Uh, so are there any things that like if COVID disappeared off the face of the earth tomorrow and, you know, business as usual could resume, like, is there anything from the kind of pandemic format that you liked, uh, especially a lot that you would kind of want to carry forward uh, regardless? You know, yes, I, I definitely think so. And even with like, I think the the good news, it, it forced all creatives to usually, it's like, oh, we did the show this way last year. We're doing it. You know, you're in a, not a cookie cutter, but you're plugging in pieces to something you've already done. So now that we've had a taste of what can be done, and I think, you know, people are open to, to seeing things differently. I would absolutely, like, I love Meg's performance. 
Meg Thee Stallions out in the desert. It was so epic and big. Um, so I, I cherish the opportunity to do big performances that don't necessarily have to be confined to the stage. But, you know, I think we've just learned to take, we're outside the box. And sometimes it's hard to get outside the box, but last year put us in a whole new way of how we look at art, how we look at the show. And, you know, we love moments at BET. So what moments we can create with all this new knowledge that we have. Well, uh, I want to congratulate you on uh, the show last year and I wish you the best of luck on the show this year. Uh, and and hopefully, uh, hopefully we will get to like an uneventful year where nothing <laughs> traumatic and, 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 and terrible is happening. Uh, and we can still celebrate, uh, you know, the great music of, of Black artists uh, in, in you know, now and going into the future. So thank Absolutely. you so much for talking with me. Thank you, Daniel. This has been great.